We are going to convert this Terminator 2 into a multi-game cabinet. It is water damaged and was going to be trashed. We will do some repair work to the cabinet to make it look brand new. Then we will install a television and an Xbox as well as a PS2 console system along with an updated control panel and some light guns. I'm going to use a television as a monitor since the Xbox and PS2 consoles are normally connected to a TV. A TV makes a good arcade monitor since it has a low resolution which is similar to many original arcade monitors. The Terminator 2 cabinet is a good choice for this conversion. It originally had a horizontal screen which worked well with our current horizontal screen of the television. This is our X arcade control panel. This panel has the ability to be used with multiple console systems. This is going to make interfacing a control panel much easier. You can see on the sides there are certain buttons that are beneath the control panel. We'll have to move these to the top later. This is a pre-made control panel. It has a 9-pin serial connector on the back which can be plugged into a PC or you can use a special adapter to connect it to your Xbox, PS2 or a number of other console systems. There is a special mode switch on the back. This allows you to save certain settings for different keys. You can change the value of the key so that it goes to a different key on your computer. We're not going to be using this for this installation. Since we're going to be switching between the PS2 and the Xbox, we do not want to change our key layout. If we do change our key layout, then when we switch between the Xbox and the PS2, the buttons may not go to the correct functions. So we're going to keep the defaults on all of these. It is possible to hack an original Xbox controller. Sometimes it can be difficult to do this. The traces that you need to sorter underneath each button can be quite small. You can try using an aftermarket controller. These are often easier to work with than the original Xbox controller. We're going to be using the X Arcade control panel so we will not have to do any special sortering. You can see the control panel severely damaged from water. The guns are also damaged but we'll be removing those. The paint's heavily faded. There's also a good bit of damage around the corners where people have been putting their hands. The cabinet is also water damaged. You can see cracks where this piece has almost come loose already. We'll be repairing that before we replace the side art. The cabinet's been stripped. All the components have been removed. I still have the original board, but I do not have the monitor or any of the other accessories including the harness. I like to use casters on all my cabinets. It makes it a lot easier to move around. You can buy these at any home supply store or you can buy them online. They're available online in various colors and sizes. I'm not going to be using these on the Terminator 2 cabinet. The Terminator 2 control panel is already quite high. Adding these would increase the height by 2 to 3 inches which would make it too high to play. This is our JAMA PCB. Many arcade games have a similar board inside of them. Our first step will be to clean this cabinet up. I'm not going to remove all of the supports on the side. If someone wants to change this back to an original T2 cabinet, they may want these in place. I'm going to leave these for now. I'm only going to remove them if I actually need to use that space. It's extremely important to clean a cabinet. Original cabinets are very dirty both on the inside and on the outside. They should be thoroughly cleaned before being used. This cabinet originally had a mirror in the back. I'm going to leave the mirror holders in place. If I don't like the TV I'm going to put in, I can move it to the bottom and install a mirror to reflect off the mirror like the original Terminator 2. This makes for a very interesting effect and makes the screen seem much deeper in the cabinet. Some of these interior supports will have to be removed. The control panel on this Terminator 2 has already been loosened. I'm going to go ahead and remove it so it will be easier to work on the cabinet. Once everything is thoroughly cleaned, I'll apply black paint, either glossy or flat black, to match the original. It's best to keep original stickers in the cabinet. If you're doing a main conversion, you want to keep a cabinet as original as possible. 
So it can be converted back if you should choose to or if someone else should choose to at a future date. Not all stickers can be recovered. You can see the water damage on the inside of this cabinet. There are a number of rough spots around the edge, so I'm going to remove the T-molding and repair all of these spots. There are also some holes in the side from bolts. All bolts have to be removed before new side art can be applied. Otherwise they will bulge through and prevent the side art from sticking properly. I'm now going to remove the T-molding. The T-molding has a lot of scratches and gouges in it, so I'm going to throw it away and put on new T-molding. Sand out all the rough spots for belt sanding. After you finish sanding, it's important to wipe everything clean so that you remove all the excess dust. Let everything dry before applying any putty. When applying putty, make sure to cover a fairly large area. You also want to make sure you get plenty in the hole. Usually some will squeeze out the other side and you'll want to smooth that off too. Put the putty on rather thick because you're going to sand it off later and you'll want to be able to sand it smooth. If you don't put enough putty, it may cause a dip in that location or you may have to re-putty it. This putty can set up in as little as three to five minutes so you'll need to work with it fast and only mix small portions at a time. How fast the putty dries depends on how much hardener you add. If you add a little bit less, it will take longer to dry. If you need more time to work with it, use the wood putty. It takes longer to dry. Once the putty is completely dry, you can sand it out. I'm going to use the belt sander to take down the roughest edges. Once all the rough edges are off, I'm going to use an orbital sander to smooth it down so it can be repainted. By painting under the edge of the T-molding, you can hide the rough look of the wood once the T-molding is installed. I'm going to smooth out all the rough edges so that they do not show through when the new side art is applied. It's best to completely remove the original side art, but it's not always practical. If your wood putty or body filler filled some of the gaps used by the T-molding, you can use a special router bit to router it out. I don't have a router bit, so I'm going to use my Dremel and a trimming tool. This is our X-Arcade control panel. This panel was chosen because it will easily integrate with both an Xbox and a PS2 using the special adapters. To best integrate this panel into our existing control panel, we're going to cut a hole in the original panel and drop this one in. That will save a lot of drilling and alignment problems with the holes. So we're keeping this panel, dropping it into a hole on the old panel, then we'll putty out the edges and it'll look like a smooth professional job. The first thing we'll do is remove the back panel from our controller. making any changes, I'm going to take a photograph of the wiring. If there's any problems later, I won't have any trouble finding which wire goes where. I'm now I'm going to carefully wire tie every wire so that its location is preserved once the buttons are removed. After I have all my wire ties in place, I label each spade connector by writing on the protective cover. I only have to write on one since these are already arranged in pairs because of my wire ties. After I write a number on the protective cover, I write it next to the button. This will make it easy to replace my connectors later. In order to remove the joysticks, you first need to remove the small connector on the back. Once the C connector is removed, you can slide out the entire joystick assembly. Make sure to keep all the pieces in order on the joystick so that they're easy to assemble later. Before we can remove the buttons, we'll first have to remove the micro switch.
The buttons in this control panel were glued in place. A small spot of glue was applied to the ring before it was screwed onto the button. You'll have to break this glue loose. You can unscrew the button once the glue is broken loose. These are standard arcade buttons. If you should damage them, you can easily replace them. Check eBay or HapControls.com. There is a mode button in the back. I will not be moving this one. It is still accessible through the coin door. This is not a regular use button, but a change mode button. This button is not normally used during play, so there is no need to move it. If you scratch your buttons while removing them, or if you are using old worn buttons, you can give them new luster. Spray them with a clear polyurethane. Several thin coats will work better than one thick coat. I now have all buttons removed from the panel. You can continue to transfer the joysticks and the controller to the new control panel. You would then need to redrill your holes and rerun all the wires. I'm not going to do this since all my holes are already drilled and my wires are already run. I'm going to reuse this existing panel. It will be easier just to drop it in than to redrill all these holes and try to get them at the perfect locations. We have buttons on the sides that need to be moved to the front, so we'll drill a hole for those. From inspecting my panel, I know that I have an additional space underneath here and underneath here. I can place my buttons from the sides. I'm now going to measure the distance between the center of the holes so that I can determine the location of my new hole. I'm also going to measure the distance between the holes to make sure that my original measurement is correct. I'm going to use a straight edge to align my new holes with the existing holes. I now have my spacing for the next hole and I have the outer edges marked. This gives me two marks to align from so I'll know that I'm in the correct location. The drill bit I used was one and one eighth inch which is standard for arcade sized buttons. I'm going to do something special for this control panel. I'm going to make a button template. simply lay it on top of poster board, trace out the buttonholes and the outline. I'm going to use this later to create a button legend or button labels that I can use on my final control panel. This way I'll know which buttons correspond to each system for Xbox, PS2 or other system that I may choose to install. Here's our scanned image of our control panel template. The first thing I'll do is make sure it's straight. I'm going to identify a straight line, mark it with a measure tool, then select image, rotate canvas, arbitrary, and the angle is already filled in. Now that I've rotated the canvas to make the top part of it straight, I know we'll have a straight line at the top. If my drawing's correct, then all of these lines should go straight through the buttons, which they do. Next, I will check my image size. This was scanned at 400 dots per inch because it was scanned on a professional scanner. I'm going to change it to 300 dots per inch because that will be easier to work with. Now that my image has been resized, I'm going to crop it. I don't need all this excess white area, 
but I'm going to leave a little bit of extra for trimming. Before doing anything else, I have to remember that this was a tracing of the top from the bottom of the panel. That means this is reversed. I need to select my background by double clicking on it. And then I can rename it. Once I do that, it's no longer a background layer, but a regular layer. Now I can select Edit, Transform, Flip Horizontal. This will flip the image. Now it's as if we're looking down on the actual control panel. All of the buttons are in the correct location, and so are the joysticks. I can verify this by looking at an original control panel. I'm now going to put out some construction lines. This will give me a firm reference for the centers of all the buttons. If a line seems to snap too much, you can zoom in. This will allow finer control of the line. I'll now create my button labels. First, I'll create a new file, 1 inch by 1 inch at 300 dots per inch. I'll then use the ellipse tool. If you hold down the shift key, it will allow you to draw a perfect circle. This creates a shape. If I double click on the clear area to the right of the layer in the layer window, I can set several styles for this layer. One option I will set is stroke. I'll select the black color. And I'll keep the default three pixels. You can see that this has added a line on the outside of our image. I'm also going to add a gradient overlay. You'll see that by default it's taken a black and white gradient. This is what I want for this button, so I'm going to keep that. If I wanted to change this, I can use this drop down to select any number of colors. The first option is always the color selected for your foreground and background. You can change these colors and then click on the first option to make the gradient your foreground and background colors. I'm going to add text. It's a little too large, so I'm going to make it smaller. And I'm going to change the color to white so it will stand out. If I click on my layer, those changes will be accepted. I can also add a stroke to the black by double clicking on the clear area in the layers window. Selecting stroke, changing the color to black, selecting OK. Now I have a button that identifies the black button for my Xbox controller. I've created a series of buttons, so I'm going to go ahead and load them one at a time. This is my first Xbox button, which is A. I'm going by the X Arcade manual, which indicates that A is the first button to the left. I use Control A to select all, edit, copy merged, then I control V to paste into my template. I'm going to zoom in. This button is my first button, which is my A button. I'm going to control T and then hold down shift to resize it, and then going to place it where I want it to go, keeping in mind that this is a one and one eighth inch hole, but there's also a lip around the button. So I need to keep some extra space available. I also want to keep some extra space available to allow for errors in mounting. Once I have this first button where I want it, I'm going to pull down a construction line to identify the top and the bottom. This will make it easy to align the rest of my buttons. Now we'll continue to import my buttons and align them in this way. But before I go any farther, I'm going to create a folder by clicking on the folder icon in the layers window. This creates a set folder. I'm going to double click on the name so I can rename it. All of these labels are for the Xbox, so I'm going to pull my layers into this new folder. I can turn off and on all of my button labels at the same time. I can also grab and move the entire set. So I will now continue 
adding all of my buttons and making sure that they're all in this Xbox set folder. I've continued adding all of my buttons and construction lines to make sure they all stayed straight. I finished with all of player 1. Since I've created a set, I can now label my player 2 very easily. I'm going to duplicate my player 1 labels by right clicking on my Xbox set and selecting duplicate layer set. It wants to know what name, so I'm going to change it to player 2. I made a lot of changes, so I'm going to save my file too. I make sure to save it as a Photoshop type file. Now that I've duplicated my original labels to the Xbox P2, I make sure I have Xbox P2 selected. I select my arrow, then I can drag and move those to the correct positions for player 2. Many of them are already aligned. I simply need to pull them into position. I can zoom in to make sure they're in the correct location for my construction lines. I now have labels on all of my buttons for my Xbox layout. I have a Terminator 2 Judgment Day CPO which is what I'm going to use for this project. This CPO is much larger than my template so I'm going to have to adjust my canvas size. First thing I'll do is name my layer. Then I'll move it to the bottom so that it does not cover up my button labels. I'm going to change my template, make it multiply so that I can see through it. I've arranged to cut my image so that the front of the current control panel is the same as the front of the current X arcade panel. I'm going to move the T2 CPO so that it aligns with my template. I also want to give a little bit of extra space around the edge so I can trim. So I'm going to create another new layer. Move this to the very bottom. And I'm going to dump black into that. Now I'm going to inspect my button layout, make sure there's no problems with the graphics. It's rather hard to see the dark lines on my dark image. I'm going to make a copy of my template, turn off the original, select the new one, change it back to normal, then I'm going to use my magic wand and select white non-contiguously. Then I'm going to hit delete to delete all of the white area. Now I can see through the original template. I'm going to clear my selection and I'm going to add a stroke to this layer make it a white stroke so it's easy to see. I'm going to make it fairly large. You'll see there's some excess noise that was not taken out by the magic wand, but that's not important right now. I'm just using this to see where the buttons will go. As you can see, many of our buttons, including our joystick, will go in the unused area where the original joystick or the original gun of the game was located. Some of the buttons will cut through his head and some of the words here, but they aren't important for gameplay, so that'll be okay. For player two, there are no problems. Nothing important is cut out. Now that I've inspected my button locations, I can look at the CPO, and I see there's a number of places where it says start. Those are no longer my start buttons, so I'm going to take those out of the original CPO. I no longer need my template, so I can turn that off. I still have some white edge around here. This was left over from the original CPO. I'm going to use my magic wand again. and I'll make sure that I have contiguous selected, because I only want this outer edge selected, not all of the white throughout the image. Now I'm going to double check one more time to make sure that all my button labels are in good locations. And they appear to be. 
So I'm going to keep this and save it. This will not be my final control panel overlay because I'm also going to use a PS2 in this system. So I'm going to add those buttons as well. I'm now going to disassemble the original control panel. These guns may look in rough shape, but someone can probably use them. So I'm going to take them off in one piece. I can offer them on eBay if I don't use them. This is a security screw that's used on many arcade games. It's a torque screw with a hole in the center. You can buy these special wrenches at HAP Controls or from most hardware stores. For the Terminator 2 control panel, I don't have to disassemble the actual controls. They can be removed by unscrewing from the bottom. When I remove my buttons, I'll save these nylon nuts. They may be useful later when I reassemble my control panel. You can see where the guns were removed, how much fading there is. This panel is pretty badly damaged, so I'm going to go ahead and use it by cutting it up. If this panel had been in good condition, I would not use it, but I would save it, or I would give it to someone that could use it, and I would cut a new panel. I'm going to have to remove the T-molding from the X-Arcade panel. I'll now use the X-Arcade panel to determine where to make my cutout. Now I have a line to cut on. I decided to also take loose the screws and knock the front panel off. This will give me a lot more free space when mounting. Computers and monitors can become very hot, especially in an enclosed cabinet. It's important to have some type of cooling. This cabinet does not have a cooling fan. Many cabinets will have a cooling fan already cut in the top. Since this one does not have one, I'm going to install a cooling fan. You can purchase a cooling fan and a protective cover from Radio Shack or from HAP Controls. I will install my fan from the inside, connected to AC power. I will install my grill on the outside and paint it black so it doesn't stand out. I've already painted the inside of the hole with black paint to hide the cut marks. I'm going to cut the center out of the main control panel. This will be the area where I drop in the X-Arcade panel. We've cut out the center of our control panel. I've mounted on the back a number of metal strips that will support the control panel once it's in place. I'm going to run screws through the front and sides to hold the control panel securely in addition to the strips that have been applied underneath. I've also reinstalled the tension brackets, which will allow my panel to be remounted. I'm now going to use some of my Bondo Home Solution, which is the same as auto body repair putty. I'm going to use this to fill in all the cracks around the edges. Don't forget to rough up the surface with some sandpaper before applying putty. I'm going to cover this one completely with putty, so that once it's finished, we can sand it down and we'll have a nice smooth surface. I've installed three shelves two to hold my console systems and one to hold software and guns. I use simple L brackets. These are easy to install and very secure. I then install the shelf to hold the TV. I carefully measure it to make sure it's at the correct height. I use heavier duty brackets to hold up the TV since it's much heavier. I need to paint my TV black so I'm first going to mask out the screen. It's easiest to mask out the screen by first applying masking tape around the edges. I can then apply a second layer of masking tape with my paper. This is much easier than trying to apply masking tape and paper at the same time. I'm now going to cut my paper to cover the screen. It doesn't have to be exact because I'm going to tape the edges.
done painting, make sure not to paint over the infrared receiver for the remote control. In order to run the cables out for my guns, I'm going to use an insert plate. This insert plate is commonly used in desks to run cables through the top. You've seen these encounters at supermarkets. These inserts are available at most office supply stores in various sizes. I've already drawn a pencil line, but it's kind of hard to see on the black, so I'm going to use a whiteout marker which draws a white line to highlight the line. You can also use a silver marker. Both of these are available at any office supply store. Here's the installed cable cover. This is not suitable for a commercial application, but for home use, these will be fine. I'm going to secure my TV using brackets. You'll want to block the TV in using brackets or some type of wood braces. The TV should not fall out if the cabinet is tilted. You do not want to move the cabinet and have the TV fall out. I'm going to use these special self-tapping screws. They will drill straight through the plastic. I've already looked through the vents on my television to make sure that I have enough clearance behind this bracket so that I can screw it in without touching any electrical components. Do not run a screw through the side without first knowing exactly what it's going to come into contact with. You do not have to run screws through the body of the television. You can use wooden braces at the top, bottom, and back to block it into place. Now that my filler is dry, I'm going to sand my control panel. I'm going to sand it smooth using a belt sander. This will make an even surface so I can apply my control panel overlay. To provide power to all my components, I'm going to use a regular power strip. These have mounting holes on the back. Make sure you find a screw that will actually fit inside the mounting hole. Once the screws are in place, I can slide my power strip over them. This is our final sanded panel. You can see where I added some regular pink bondo. I switched back to the regular version. You can use either version, they work equally well. The only difference between the red bondo for body repair and the white version for home use is the color. I'm now going to use a damp cloth to clean the remainder of the dust off the panel. This is my new custom Terminator 2 control panel overlay. It's the same as the original overlay except it has the buttons labeled for my Xbox, PC, and PS2. I'm not going to be using a PC in this cabinet but I wanted to have the labels in place in case I wanted to add one later. Before applying my control panel overlay, I want to make absolutely sure that my panel is clean. There should be no greasy spots, no dust, and no oil on it. Since this panel already has the button labels, I need to make sure that they align. The first step is to place the control panel so that all the buttons do align. I can do this easily by placing a lamp underneath my panel. You can see how the holes shine through. This will make alignment easy. Once I have one side aligned properly, I'll take a piece of tape and tape that side of the panel into place. I can then move to the other side. I then double check to make sure that my first side did not move. Okay, all my buttonholes look to be in the correct place. Now I want to hinge this panel since it's in the correct location. I'm going to apply additional tape at the top. Now that my panel is hinged, I no longer need these pieces on the side. I can lift my control panel overlay and put it back down and it will be in the same position because of my hinge. I now carefully remove my backing.
and then I will lower it into place beginning at the top. Once you have a straight line that's clearly attached, it will be easy to apply the rest of the panel. If you have any air bubbles, you can pop them with a pen, or you can try to lift the panel and reapply it. If you're using an original metal panel, it may be easier to pull loose. If you're using a bondoed panel, I don't recommend pulling it up too often. Also, if you're using a fiberglass panel, you may not be able to lift the control panel overlay once it touches the panel. To apply to fiberglass, you should use wet water. Once the panel's in place, I'm going to use a soft cotton cloth. You can also use a terry cloth towel. We seem to have a few spots in it, but these are actually where the holes are cut. We'll cut those out and those will be covered. If you're concerned about adhesion or your panel is not sticking properly, you can use 3M spray adhesive. First, I'm going to make a test spray off of the panel to make sure my spray is working. Then I'm going to spray the panel. You should let your spray adhesive dry for several minutes before actually applying the control panel overlay. Make sure the entire panel is pressed down well. You want to make sure to roll them tight so there's no puffy edge. You may need to secure them with small finishing nails. If you have a professional squeegee, you can use this to smooth out the control panel overlay. You have to be careful using a squeegee like this on glossy material. It can scratch it. Control panel overlays are textured and will not show scratches as easily. My coin door is in good shape, so I'm not going to have to repaint it. For my sound system, I'm going to use a regular car audio amplifier. This is just one that I happen to have laying around. I have a power supply that's suitable for this amplifier. You should check both the voltage and the current rating before using a power supply. My cabinet did not have a marquee with it, but I have a new reproduction from Classic Arcade Graphics, including the plexiglass. I also have the original hold down. If you don't have one of these, they can be purchased from HAP Controls. You can also buy a 90 degree piece of aluminum at any home store or hardware store. In order to mount a backlit type marquee, you need to attach it to the plexiglass. A small piece of tape along the top will do this, but you can also use an edge cover like this, which is also available from HAP Controls. It has a small channel that fits over the plexiglass and the marquee. Someone's already taken out the fluorescent light that was in here. I'm not going to replace it because I'm not going to use an illuminated marquee. If you wanted to use one, you can use a light stick which is available at Walmart or any department store. My speaker holes are already cut. The original speakers have been removed. I'm going to replace them with my new speakers. Now that my speakers are in place, I'm ready to install the marquee. Once my marquee is in place, I install my retainer. If you don't have the original screw, any drywall screw will work. Installing my marquee raked off some of the press board along the edge, making a dirty edge. I want to make a quick repair to that. Now I'm going to install my coin door. It has some screws with some hole downs that need to be tightened around the back.
Using our power strip cord would make the overall length too short. Now I'll run the extension cord through the back of the cabinet, just like the original. My bottom shelf is for holding software and accessories, so I'm going to put my TV remote control on the bottom in case I need it. I also may need my TV instructions later, so I'm going to tuck them in the side. They'll always be there if I need them. The only line-in input for my TV is on the front, so I'm going to use a 90 degree adapter with my RCA cable. I have my cut plexiglass ready for my bezel. I'm going to make sure that the side with the protective coating is on the outside. Then I'm going to mark the location of my power button and my infrared remote detector. Before I mount my bezel, I need to cut out the center section. I'm going to measure the offsets at the top, sides, and bottom for my screen. If you don't want to spend so much time sanding and puttying, you can cover the panel using laminate or formica. This will give a smooth surface without all the puttying. Now that my panel is cured, I'm ready to start installing the button. First you find an open hole. Then you cut it with a utility knife. Make an X across the entire hole. Gently lift up the excess and cut it with a utility knife. There are a number of different types of arcade buttons you can use. This is a leaf switch type. It uses this type of a button. Install the button. When you press the switch, it makes the contacts close. These are generally installed on metal or thin plywood control panels. If you put this on a three quarter inch control panel, you won't have enough clearance. This is a vertical type micro switch button. Notice the top is concave. There's another type of button that has a rounded top. I don't like the other types of buttons. They feel cheap and they do not seem like real arcade buttons. When you buy buttons, make sure you get a quality button that has the concave top. This is an example of a horizontal microswitch button. You can see how it compares to a vertical microswitch button. Switch placement is different. It depends on how deep your control panel is as to which one you choose. There are a number of options for labeling your control panel. These types of labels are no longer available. You can still purchase the clear acrylic cover and print your own labels using your home printer. You can also label buttons yourself. This button was labeled using a dry transfer. You can purchase dry transfer sheets from Radio Shack or from most office supply or hobby shops. Simply take the dry transfer, place it over the button, rub it with a pencil, and the dry transfer will be transferred to your button. This will not last very long as it is, it will come off with constant rubbing of the button. After you apply your dry transfer, take some clear nail polish and put it over the button. A really thick coat over the top. This will protect the dry transfer and it will make it usable as a button. I decided not to use all of the original black buttons. Instead, I'm going to use some colored buttons. Since I labeled my panel on the underside, I can easily identify which micro switch should be connected to the button. 
we're going to remove the switch that's currently connected to the button. Make sure you install all of the button nuts before connecting the wires. I'm using vertical buttons because those are the ones I had available, but you should really use horizontal buttons for the X Arcade system. Otherwise, you'll have to stretch some wires. I'm also going to change out the joysticks. These are the original black joysticks. I'm going to use a blue and red joystick to match the colors on the control panel. My new joysticks did not require the additional spacer, so I removed the large spacer and added a spring. I'll add a retainer to hold the joystick in place. Once it's in place, I want to make sure that it works properly. Now we have a finished panel with all of our new buttons and new joysticks in place. In order to turn your television on and off, you'll need a way to reach the power switch. Once the bezel's up, that will be blocked. I built a special button that I can use to turn the television on and off through the bezel. I'm using a plexiglass bezel so I can drill a hole through it. When drilling plexiglass, you can often start out with a small hole and then use progressively larger bits. You should also go at a very slow speed to avoid cracking the plastic. I place my holder in front of the button and I glue it or screw it down. I then take my button, which is nothing more than a painted dowel rod, insert through my guide, and it will meet the power switch. This will extend through the bezel. Once the bezel is in place, all I'll have to do is press this button to press the power switch. To hold everything in place, I'll put a rubber cover over the end. You can purchase rubber toggle switch covers, which serve this purpose very well. They will prevent the button from being pulled out through the bezel while holding it in place at the same time. My television doesn't require pressing the power button to turn it on, so I'm not going to install this. There's also an infrared detector for the remote. I am going to make sure that I cut out a hole in my cardboard bezel so that I can see this from the outside. Then I can access television features through the remote. I can change settings, change channels, and I can turn the TV on and off. This particular TV remembers its last setting, so it will automatically come on when power is applied. I'm now ready to apply the side art. I'm going to be doing a dry application. This means you apply the side art directly. There's another technique for applying vinyl, which is called a wet method. The wet method uses wet water. If you're going to use this method, you should make sure that you use the cheapest generic soap you can find. It should not have any lotions or oils in it. The wet water is applied the same way that you would spray Windex on the cabinet using a spray gun. There are also special chemical mixtures, especially designed for applying vinyl. You can use Windex instead of wet water, however, the ammonia may interfere with some adhesives. Apply the side art before putting on the T-molding. I'm going to leave a little bit of extra side art to hang around the edges which I will tuck under the T-molding. This will hide any rough edges, and in a commercial installation, it will also make it more difficult for people to peel off the side art. You can spray the side of the cabinet with 3M spray adhesive, just like we did with the control panel. This will make the adhesive stick much more firmly. I'm not going to spray this cabinet because this is going in a home and I don't have to worry about people trying to peel the side art off. I'm going to show you how to install side art on an upright cabinet. The first thing you do is prop up one side by putting small wooden blocks under the cabinet. This will give you some room at the bottom to work with. We're going to clean the side of the cabinet. It's very important that the cabinet be clean. This may still have some dust left on it from sanding, so I'm going to wipe it down thoroughly. You do not want any dirt or oil on the side of the cabinet. This will cause the side art to fail. You especially want to pay attention to the edges. That's where the side art will fail first. Make sure the edges are very clean and there's no contamination. You then take the side art, fold down approximately two inches from the top. Crease the backing so that it stays down. You'll use this to align and to hold the side art in place while you apply it. Before applying side art, make sure you have the correct side some side art can be used on either side, but some, such as this Terminator 2, have a left and right distinct side.
Again, pay special attention to the edges. You want to make sure these are down firmly. I'm now going to trim the side art with a utility knife. I'm going to leave an extra 1 8 to 1 quarter inch to fold under my T-molding. If you do find an air bubble after you've installed your side art, you can pop it with a pin or you can try to roll it out to the side. You should try to roll it out to the side first using your terry cloth or your cotton rag. You can also install side art using a squeegee, but you have to be very careful. Glossy side art easily scratches and it can show these scratches if you drag a squeegee across it. It's best to use a soft cloth like a cotton rag or terry cloth towel. Now that my side art's installed and trimmed, I can install my T-molding. When you encounter a sharp corner, cut the inside of the T out. This will allow the T molding to wrap around the corner without bulging. Wire cutters like these do an excellent job of making an accurate trim. If you need to fit T-molding to an inside curve, simply cut the inside T in several places. The T-molding will then expand the fit inside the curve easily. If there's no T-molding going down the back of your cabinet, you can wrap the side art around and tack it using carpet tacks or staples. This will help prevent peeling from the back. You may also want to take the 3M spray adhesive and just spray it along the edges. This will help to guarantee that your side art stays in place. I'm almost ready to connect the control panel. I want to use both an Xbox and a PS2, which means two different controllers have to be connected to the same panel. In order to do this, I'm going to use a serial switching box. These are available from any electronics store and most department stores. This will allow me to switch between different multiple serial connections. I also have some serial extension cables. The XRK uses a standard 9-pin serial connector. I'm now going to lay my plexiglass on top of my printed bezel. You can see where I marked it for the infrared remote detector. I'm going to make a note of where this is on my bezel. It happens to be right after the text in a black spot. That's good because now I can punch a hole in the black spot and it will not affect the artwork of the bezel. I will then be able to use the infrared remote control on my television. Now that I have a hole cut, I'm going to use a magic marker to outline it. This will hide the white cut line. I'll wipe down my bezel once more just to make sure that it's clean, there's no dust on it. Now that I have my bezel trimmed, I can remove the protective covering from one side of my plexiglass. In order to make the bezel stick to the plexiglass, I'm going to use regular scotch tape. A couple of pieces across the top, not on the front of the glass, but just on the top and the back of the bezel will hold it in place. Once the bezel is mounted, friction will hold it in place. I let the tape overlap the top just a little bit because this is going to be hidden once the bezel is installed. There is the wooden piece that covers the top of the bezel which will hide the tape. Our control panel is installed. It was just a drop in installation. The original control panel had pull downs that allows it to lock into place. I'm going to order some lethal enforcer replacement gun holsters. They will hold the guns like this on the control panel. You see how the gun cable exits the cabinet. We can easily replace or swap guns. Here's the back of our cabinet. You can see the television with its securing bracket in place. If we go a little bit lower, you see the Xbox and the PS2, as well as the power amplifier on the left side. This is for our audio. The video out and audio out of both the Xbox and the PS2 go to an AB switch. The output of the AB switch goes to the stereo car amplifier for our audio and to the television for our video. You can see the back of the control panel selector. We have our Xbox and our PS2 adapters for our control panel attached to it. For a console system, you'll probably be reaching inside of it a lot. You may want to remove the remaining coin door operating mechanism, unless you're going to be using this in a commercial location. You can see our switching unit, which allows us to switch between the Xbox and the PS2 to the control panel. Our AB unit allows us to switch between the A and the B input, which is our Xbox and our PS2. We'll probably have to be swapping out controllers for both our PS2 and for our Xbox. The PS2 only has two controller connectors for player one and player two. 
This means if both player control panel connectors are attached to the PS2, there's no location for a light gun to be connected. You have to remove player 1 or player 2, usually it would be player 1, in order to connect your light gun. If you want to use the control panel, you will have to change connectors. The Xbox allows up to four connectors, but it only allows one light gun for many games, so you may have to connect or disconnect a second light gun. You may also have to remove the connectors and connect the controller for some games. This is our final Terminator 2 project machine. We now have an Xbox and a PS2 both running inside the machine. We can switch between them by using an AB and a selector switch for the control panel. We can not only play gun games, but we can play other games using the buttons and joysticks. Once you have your system up and working, you can swap out the Xbox or the PS2 for any other game console. Some things to be aware of when you're setting up your system. The Xbox must be calibrated with the guns in normal mode. That means no auto reload and no auto fire. If you have a modded Xbox, you may have to set it so it does not display the menu on boot. Sometimes the menu requires an actual controller to be connected. For the PS2, most guns have a switch that allow you to switch between GunKind 2, GunKind, and Normal. You may have to use Normal mode for PSX games. I wanted to thank you for watching. I hope you've learned a lot from this video. For more information on restoring or converting cabinets, see our other videos.